Order our days in thy peace and command that we be rescued from eternal damnation and numbered in the flock of thine elect. Words taken from the canon of the Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. One of the maxims and councils of St. Philip Neri, the Apostle of Rome, 16th century great reformer of the Church, he says... He who does not go down into hell while he is alive runs a great risk of going there after he is dead. He who does not go down into hell while he is alive runs a great risk of going there after he is dead. What's the saint saying? Well, in order to avoid going to hell in the next life, We must go there now in meditation, in reflection and study, and even by voluntarily embracing various trials and penances and mortifications. These are just a couple of ways we, as it were, go to hell in this life to avoid going there in the next In fact, several saints, such as Teresa of Jesus and the children at Fatima, they saw hell and even went down into hell themselves, helping them to avoid as fires in eternity. We call them saints and blessed now. We call upon their intercession. Furthermore, St. Benedict, the father of Western monasticism, says in his holy rule that to be in dread of hell is an instrument of good works. When we're in dread of hell, we want to do good and avoid evil. Now, how can we be in dread of hell unless we meditate upon it, understand it, and consider the reality of its flames? Yikes. So this Sunday, let us take up this forbidden subject and look into this most dreadful of places keeping in mind that hell is unfortunately the home of most people. After all, our Lord and King said, Enter ye at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there are who go thereat. Many there are who go in thereat. we also must be convinced that the devil has a place prepared in that pit for us. Be assured, he has planned our ruin in fine detail. He knows our names. He knows who we are. Listen to St. Teresa of Jesus. I suddenly found that without knowing how, I had seemingly been put in hell. I understood that the Lord wanted me to see the place the devils had prepared there for me. And she then experienced all the pains and sufferings of hell. She was jammed into a little niche in the rock. St. Teresa considered this visit to hell a great favor. Why not then see what He has prepared for us in order to counteract and frustrate his evil designs. Think of it. What a victory it will be for us to crush the devil and hell underfoot for all eternity in heaven. We want that victory to be yours. First, let's consider an old error, an old heresy about hell that has resurfaced in our time. The reason it's resurfaced is because evolution is so popular. The writings of people like the heretical Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin have brought it back. And what I'm thinking of here is that hell is not eternal. That's the heresy. That hell is not eternal. That's false. These folks hold that eventually everyone will be released since everything is evolving, there's nothing permanent in evolution, see? 
So for Chardin, we're all evolving to the omega point of Jesus Christ. He got that part right. He is the omega. But not everything's evolving to Christ. And there is no evolution anyway. To arrive at this conclusion, however, one would have to do great violence to the Scriptures and make a liar out of the Son of God. Since the Scriptures are very clear on this point, some examples. The last verse in the book of the prophet Isaiah reads, And they shall go out and see the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. Their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. And they shall be a loathsome sight to all flesh. The worm that dieth not. The fire is not extinguished. Isaiah. How about Judith? For he will give fire and worms into their flesh that they may burn and may feel forever. Our Lord repeated this notion of the worm that dieth not in the Gospels. You can look it up. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. That's one example. And he repeatedly referred to hell as an everlasting fire. These same points are restated by St. Peter, St. John, and St. Jude in the New Testament. Now furthermore, if hell were temporary, even lasting hundreds or thousands of years, it would only be another purgatory, wouldn't it? But in purgatory, there's no malice, but rather there's faith, hope, and love. The devil, hello, the devil is not showing any signs of repentance. There's no signs of love coming from down there. Hell is the home of malice. Also, this notion of a temporary hell is very injurious to good morals. If all are eventually rehabilitated, then there's no despair. There's no unforgivable sins. But wait a minute. Jesus said, And whoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But he that shall speak against the Holy Ghost... It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Nor in the world to come. Matthew 12, 32. Hell is real. You can't get out. It's eternal. It's a place we want to avoid at all costs. Now another rather silly and very erroneous thing people say about hell is that it's empty. Maybe you've heard that one. Or that we cannot say for sure anyone is in hell, therefore it must be empty, or it could be empty, since we can't say anyone is in there. That's not true. Although the church does not canonize, that is, she does not declare with an infallible statement who is in hell, she has nevertheless spoken in various ways about people being in hell. For example, she has spoken through her head, our Lord Jesus Christ. He said Judas was the son of perdition. The son of perdition. And that it were better for him if he had not been born. And we read how Satan entered into him, how all was night for Judas, leading him to betray the Son of God with a kiss, leading him to despair, leading him to commit suicide with his guts spilling out on the ground, such that St. Peter later said he would go to his own place. That he might go to his own place. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, 25. So the fathers and the doctors and the mystics say over and over again that Judas went to hell. Dante puts him in the lowest pit of hell. 
The fathers, the doctors, the mystics also speak consistently that Solomon went to hell because of his many wives. You can find it in the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Jesus. You can find it in the Father, St. Augustine, St. Clement of Rome. What about Nathan and Abiram and all their families in the book of Numbers? The ground opened up and the earth came alive and swallowed them in fire and flames. This is not a myth. These were people. We know their names. Furthermore, St. Jude says in his letter, Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities in like manner, having given themselves to fornication and going after other flesh, were made an example, suffering the punishment of eternal fire. Verse 7. Wait a minute. Are the buildings of Sodom and Gomorrah, is that what's undergoing eternal fire? No, that's nonsense. He's talking about the inhabitants. We know that they went to hell. They refused to repent. And finally, we have the children of Fatima. They saw hell teeming with damned souls and fallen angels, which perfectly agrees with what many saints have seen. Namely, that souls are falling into hell like snowflakes in a snowstorm. Hell is very much populated. It's teeming. And we can know with some assurance, we can know the names of various people there. Now consider a story from the life of St. Pacomius. He's one of the fathers of monastic life. Story of St. Pacomius. As Pacomius was arriving at one of his monasteries for a visit one day, he saw the religious taking out the body of one of their brothers to bury it, chanting according to the custom of the church. They all stopped as soon as they saw him coming that he might pray for the dead man. The saint did so. But upon ending his prayer, he gave them orders to stop chanting, had the dead man's religious garb taken off of him, and burned before everyone. He forbade them to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass for him and told them to go and bury him on the mountain without any ceremony. The man had been a monk whom Pacomius had often warned to correct himself, but who had never wanted to profit from his advice. Such stories can be found in the lives of many saints. Now, although we could certainly spend some time on the doctrine of hell, going through some of the details of what hell is, it seems more constructive to me at this point to attend to a few more stories from a mystic who herself mysteriously went down into hell frequently so she wouldn't go there in the next life. But she went down there to suffer so others would not go there. And here I'm thinking of the mystic sister, Josefa Menendez. You can read about it in The Way of Divine Love. You won't regret reading that book. All the doctrine of hell is contained in her stories. I'm going to give you a few today. So in her life, our Lord came to her many times and repeated His sorrow for the innumerable souls that were lost forever in hell. He repeatedly stated that. There are innumerable souls that are lost in hell forever. And he named one Judas. Are we surprised? Here is how she describes what she experienced. I was dragged along a very dark and lengthy passage, and on all sides resounded terrible cries. On opposite sides of the walls of this narrow corridor were niches out of which poured smoke, though with very little flame, and which emitted an intolerable stench. From these recesses came blaspheming voices uttering impure words. Some cursed their bodies, others their parents. Others again reproached themselves with having refused grace and not avoided what they knew to be sinful. It was a medley of confused screams of rage and despair. 
I was dragged through that kind of corridor which seemed endless. Then I received a violent punch which doubled me in two and forced me into one of the niches. I felt as if I were being pressed between two burning planks and pierced through and through with scorching needle points. Opposite and beside me, souls were blaspheming and cursing me. What caused me most suffering and with which no torture can be compared was the anguish of my soul to find myself separated from God. That is the essence of hell. It's called pena damni, the pain of damnation, the pain of separation from God. It seemed to me that I spent long years in that hell, yet it lasted only six or seven hours when suddenly I was violently pulled out of the niche and I found myself free. How can I describe my feelings on realizing that I was still alive and could still love God? I can see clearly that all the sufferings of earth are nothing in comparison with the horror of no longer being able to love, for in that place all breathe hatred and thirst to damn other souls. When she arrived at the niche, the damned would say things like this, Hello, you religious here? You're supposed to be holy. They mocked her. Now her superiors were convinced these visions were real, as at times I think her bed caught on fire and also the smell of sulfur and whatnot came back with her at times from hell. And they had other signs as well. But she explained how the soul throws itself into that pit as if to hide from God in order to be free to hate and curse Him. How a certain thirst to to curse seizes the soul such that the more one curses, the more one wants to curse That's what it's like to be in hell. Forced hatred is a thirst that consumes the soul there. And no past joys, no past pleasures can afford the soul the slightest relief. There's no memory of anything good in hell. In fact, they despise all that led them to sin. The pains of hell completely overtake all the pleasures of sin. They hate the parts of their body that led them to sin. They hate them and despise them and curse them. That's hell. She repeatedly stated that no single member of the body is excluded from the pains of hell. She says, I felt as if they were endeavoring to pull out my tongue but could not. This torture reduced me to such an agony that my very eyes seem to be starting out of their sockets. Not a fingernail escapes terrifying torments. And all the time one cannot move even a finger to gain some relief, nor change posture, for the body seems flattened out and doubled in two. In other words, the body is turned in on itself. You're stuck with yourself forever. There's no community, there's no love. An amazing picture she paints. So while in that terrible place, she heard various things. One of those damned souls cried out, this is my torture that I want to love and cannot. There's nothing left me but hatred and despair. If one of us could so much as make a single act of love, this would no longer be hell. But we cannot. We live on hatred and malevolence. She records too how the accusations of these unhappy souls were made against themselves. Some yell, where is our loot now? Cursed hands, why did I want to possess what did not belong to me? And what in any case I could keep only for a few days? Others cursed their tongues, their eyes, whatever was the occasion of their sin. Now, O body, one said, you are paying the price of the delights you granted yourself. And you did it of your own free will. 
I saw many worldly people fall into hell and no words can render the horrible and terrifying cries. Damn forever, they yelled. I deceived myself. I am lost. I am here forever. There's no remedy possible. A curse be upon me. On one occasion, Sister Josepha writes, I saw a vast number of people fall into the fiery pit. They seemed to be worldlings and a demon cried vociferously, The world is ripe for me. I know that the best way to get hold of souls is to rouse their desire for enjoyment, for pleasure. Have them say, put me first. Me before the rest. No humility for me. Let me enjoy myself. This sort of thing assures me victory, my rights. And they tumble headlong into hell. On another occasion, she writes, I saw several souls fall into hell and among them was a child of 15 cursing her parents for not having taught her to fear God nor that there was even a hell. Her life had been a short one, she said, but full of sin for she had given into all that her body and passions demanded. And most notably, she had read many bad books. Wow. What can be said of our time today when the internet, iPhones and smartphones and all that is so readily available? To avoid this condemnation ourselves, let us take the advice of St. Philip and not be afraid to go down into hell in this life by meditating on its existence, by considering the place that's being prepared there for us, what will it look like? What will it feel like? By taking up voluntary sufferings and sacrifices so that we will not go there in the next. Let us avoid this terrible place by abhorring all, each and every mortal sin, saying to ourselves, death before sin. And finally, remember, Our Lady of Fatima came to keep us out of hell and to help others stay out of hell. During the July 13 apparition, the very one she showed hell to the little children, she said, sacrifice yourself for sinners. And say often, especially when you make some sacrifice, O my Jesus, it is for the love of Thee, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I make this sacrifice. At the August apparition of Our Lady, she said, pray, pray very much, and make sacrifice for sinners. Many souls are lost, because there are none to make sacrifices for them. And finally, when we understand hell, part of staying out of hell is not wanting anyone, even our worst enemy, to go there. We should pray, as our Lord taught us through Our Lady, O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, Save us from the fires of hell and lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.